Hey, it's me, Jen again. And some endocrinologists, ENTs, surgeons, and interventional radiologists have adopted thyroid RFA. And now a cytopathologist joins their ranks. We'll hear more from Dr. Yasmin El Shanawi after this. If you value this content, please subscribe to this channel because that really helps YouTube to put these videos in front of more people. And that helps more people be able to save their thyroid from surgery through radiofrequency ablation, a treatment that shrinks thyroid nodules directly and preserves the thyroid gland itself. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Yasmin El Shanawi in Johnson City, Tennessee. Not only is she the first provider to offer thyroid RFA in the state of Tennessee, but she's the first cytopathologist in the entire U.S. to adopt this procedure. Having a diagnostician background gives Dr. El Shinoe a very unique perspective on the thyroid RFA procedure. Let's talk to her and hear more about how this helps her patients. So, you know, I'm very excited and I watched some of your videos and actually uh, the reason I knew about it, one of the patients I had, you know, he watched your videos and he told me, you know, you should have an interview with her because you... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, she she's a patient advocate and he was, he's having his RP, you know, this week too. So people listen, you're doing a good job. <laughs> oh, wow. So encouraging when I hear people say things like that. He said, because it helps when you know what other doctors are thinking and from a patient perspective, patient yeah. to patient is different. Well, I am so excited to meet you. You are the first doctor I've talked to in Tennessee that's, that's doing good. RFA. Maybe, you know, maybe in the first, but I'm sure there will be more. The most interesting thing about you is the fact that you are not an endocrinologist, no. not an ENT, <laughs> and you're not an interventional radiologist. So. Um, Surgeon too. You're not a surgeon. That's right. No. That's right. I left one of them out. Tell us what exactly it is that you do as a cytopathologist. I'm a doctor, but also I'm a pathologist. We're hidden behind the microscopes. We read the slides. We, we do blood work. We look at bone marrow. We look at thyroid biopsies. But you never ever encounter your pathologist, the one who made your diagnosis. Cytopathologist. Or my background. I'm an interventional cytopathologist, which mm -hmm. I'm a doctor. You know, like I'm a radiologist. Mm -hmm. and a cytopathologist who reads cells. Everything is comprehensive. You know, mm -hmm. what we do is patient comes, we scan them, do the biopsy, tell them what it is and issue a report and then report back to the referring provider or the clinician with a management plan. He needs surgery, he needs RFA, he needs another biopsy, he needs to be seen back in a year. That's my background. So I'm different than other doctors. So yeah. I'm, I'm agnostician and interventional and mm -hmm. I treat other than RFA. How did your background lead you to wanting to adopt this procedure? Because I can see that with the biopsies being in your toolkit, there's a skill set there that you possess that would lend itself to RFA. RFA itself is an ultrasound and guided procedure. I, I'm in this practice now for almost 10 years. I can tell that I did more than 10,000 finely evascuation biopsies. I do that daily. <laughs> you know? Wow. For every nod is two sticks and we have to be precise. Like I go for after a four millimeter, two millimeter microcarcinoma. I have the skill, you know, for, mm -hmm. for this tedious RFA procedure because RFA is like simply just a directed ultrasound to certain areas and you try to avoid all the complications around it. You try to go after the nodule and be in the nodule as much as you can and target the lesion one by one, one by one, one by one until you complete the nodule. When I first encountered or I knew about RFAs, you know, this was in 2017. Mm -hmm. I was in a Zoom meeting and this was just a talk, you know, like a brief talk with my, you know, colleagues and other people and international speakers, you know, and they were talking about how it is. And then I start reading and reading and knowing more about it. And I think, I think it can benefit my patients because, you know, they ask me this question every day, what we should do. So that's how I adapted and I fell in love with it. When you first learned about it, you said it was in 2017. So that was before it was FDA cleared. Yes, it was in the endocrinologist meeting in was in Orlando, I believe, and we were attending, you know, stuff for the ECMO certification. And so I start learning it from my other colleagues, like internationally, you know, they were talking about this procedure being done in Europe, mm -hmm. in Brazil and South Korea, and they having this results, you know, that's the good thing about meetings. You know? And you see all their experience, you know, all in one pot. Ah, we don't have that. And no, I do procedures, but it's different than what you guys are doing. And then I start like 
oh well, what's our pain we st i start to you know learning and it's like slowly by slowly you, you you find this amazing nature with amazing successful rates of people getting cured and also you know when you go see how patient satisfaction rates from these studies you see how happy they are and most of them they think they made the right decision i support them on that i'm so thankful for this procedure it's been a, a life-changing thing for me so I know that there's so many patients out there that are thankful when they discover it because there's not been any other alternative until now for to surgery. So what did you do to actually learn the procedure hands-on? Well, as you said, I have the skill of managing the ultrasound and the needle. This was not an issue. And it's a big issue for some people because they, they never know how to learn to hold the probe and put the needle to know all the anatomy and stuff. So also I had the ECNO certification, which is the endocrine uh, certification of head and neck, you know, scans and stuff. That, that's helped me to understand all the anatomy and all the variables and what I should be aware of and nerves and, you know, important structure and also anatomical variation. We're not equal. The mm -hmm. vagus nerve, I may have here, I may have here. So this all, I, I think, made me very strong about starting, you know, my RFA. Of course, you need hands-on, you need to learn uh, other than webinars and self-studies and cadavers and all these things. So I went to Santa Monica uh, Sideway Center, it's Dr. Guffler, you know, in California, and I learned and I had the course there with him and I think it did great. I know that there, there's so much anatomy in the neck and yeah. it's so important that you know what to stay away from <laughs> because that can be a problem. <laughs> yes, it's a big, big 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 problem you know it's, it's it is because it's a very vulnerable scene cosmetically important it, 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 there's a lot of important structure you have your food pipe you had your esophagus you had you know your airway nerves it, it's very important <laughs> it's not hidden rfa is getting to be more known and there's a lot of doctors who are like well i just you know can't go to the meetings and and so that's a barrier I did it and i was Fortunate enough that I found Dr. Guffler that he offered that I can come during COVID. He was so helpful. So, what's your caseload like for RFA? The caseload since we started, you know, we have been doing one or two a month, which for this area, and we're not pushing, we're not advertising. It's just our patients when they come. Yeah. We have a consultation and let them understand everything and go through their biopsies because most most of the time I'm the one who read their biopsies. I, one of my group here has read it. You know, there's not a single provider that I'm aware of in uh, the Carolinas. You're the first in Tennessee. There's no one in Alabama. There's one in Georgia. There's one in Virginia. So you're in an area where you could potentially be seeing a lot of people from out of state. I'm sure, you know, we'll have more uh, patients. Once patients become aware, sometimes when I talk to the patient, the providers are not aware of Let others like family doctors, you know, um, internal medicine, ENT, most of the time they know, but not all of them, you know, mm -hmm. because I work very closely with ENT and endocrinologists. When I started this RFA a year ago, some of them were not aware. So it's not just the patient. The patient is one factor, but also, you know, the others. My patients, when they come, they ask what we should do. What's our next step? I usually ask them, do you have complaints? Does it affect your breathing? Does it affect your swallowing? Is it functionally affecting you? Is it cosmetically making you feel like something is there? And if they say no, then you're good. You know, if, you, if it's not bothering you and you can keep an eye on it, but some of them it's bothering them. The old days I used to tell them surgery, you know, that's that's the only option. One or two years after your lobectomy, you may have to take thyroid medicine. So RFA becomes very helpful on that point to help at least to give you the quality of life and the breathing. We can, we can do something. You become very grateful when that normal breathing and swallowing is restored. And that's why I think so many patients are so passionate about explaining this to other people and, and telling the world about it because they know just how important it is to be able to have normal function in, in those things. And what you were saying a moment ago about the providers, I absolutely agree. One of my goals is to help connect patients and providers because so many providers don't know about it. And so many um, patients are going to their providers and, and saying, you know, do you know about this? And their providers are just shutting them down. Mm -hmm. and the problem is that they need to be educated about it too. <laughs> it's very true. Like it's patient driven, you know, they want it the other way. They found, they want to find the more natural way. They want to find something which can like, save them from having thyroid medication the rest of their life. And a scar and sometimes a busy mom or a, or a, or a young girl who want to get pregnant. We know the thyroid is a very vital organ. So if it's, you take it out, everyone is react differently. You may be good in medicine. I may not be good. You know, it's just, it's, yep. at that point, there is no return. 
for RFA, there's a return point. If you're not happy with your RFA, there's always surgery. It's an important option, you know, to keep your thyroid, which is a maestro, you know, it's communicating everything. I usually tell my patient, it's your thermostat, you know, like your AC, you know, so it fine tune everything in your body because most of them, they don't know what the thyroid does sometimes. Not every patient tolerates the medicine well. Uh, not every patient can take the same medication. You know, there has to be fine tuning of the medication. I've, I've even read that you can't take it within so long of drinking your morning coffee. You know, there's all kinds of variables at play. And ultimately, if you can have a, a modality to treat the problem that doesn't involve a lifelong medication, that's always preferable. So it's exciting to me that this is growing in prominence. And I think that you being in, in Tennessee, it's going to help a lot, as I said, in those surrounding states to bring awareness. I want to see it grow because the more mm -hmm. it grows, insurance will also find this thing has to be done. It's very beneficial. Do you have a self-pay option for patients or, or do you allow them to file on insurance at your practice? No, we do a self-pay, you know, okay. for benign thyroid nodules. I'm not aware that it's covered. The self-motivated, they think it's still investigational. So in our Facebook group, we've got about 2,300 patients. We're finding that some of them are having success filing on insurance. Some of them are having to fight. <laughs> Many of them are appealing it multiple times and winning. It just depends a lot on the insurance provider. I think somewhat also it depends on the institution. There's a lot of variables at play. We help our patient as much as we can. The patient, which I did an RFA for a thyroid carcinoma on her, she was a poor surgical candidate. She had surgery twice, she had a small recurrence, and it needs to be done. You know, they cannot take her to surgery. Mm -hmm. So we did it, and we did it when we filed with the insurance, and we will wait and see. <laughs> so it just depends from case to case and things. Mm -hmm. It's very important, you know, for the insurance to be aware. It's a, it's a, it's a medical necessary. It's it's a, it's a life or death. It has to be done. Yes, I think the medically necessary part is key, and I think that helping insurance companies to understand that medically necessary can be a lot of different things for a lot of different people is also important because you have the people like you were just explaining, she, there's no way she could have surgery. But then you also have the people who just, it's not a good idea for them to be on medication. You know, they can probably tolerate the surgery, but they may not tolerate the medication. Um, I, I think that medically necessary, it can be a very broad uh, yeah, thing. We'll do everything to try to you know, get this thing in the insurance world because it's very important. I'm hoping, you know, things will, will move better for all our patients. I was curious, are you open to having physicians come and like observe your cases or, you know, working alongside you to learn about this? You know, I'm, I'm open because I'm clinical associate professor also, you know, in East Tennessee State University, which I did my residency at. Mm -hmm. So we have residents, we have family doctors, we have medical students. So we always would have people coming. We also have some cytopathologists who want to start practice like us because our practice started 30 years ago uh, and uh, it was one of the kind in the U.S. at that time and it's still, you know, what we do is very, very specialized. So we have a lot of pathologists and people who want to start their practice, they come and we, we accommodate them and they stay with us at two or three days a week as much as they can and we try to help them to, to start their practice somewhere else and we had a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So I think RFA, I haven't had anyone came to watch me doing RFA, but um, I explained like the other things I do. I was recently meeting with a doctor who was thinking about beginning RFA uh, in his practice. And I was explaining to him about a doctor that I had a biopsy done with who was a pathologist. And it was so interesting to me because not only did he do a better job as far as my comfort level uh, mm -hmm. than any other biopsy I've had done, but when I explained to him why I was having the biopsy done, which was the fact that I was pursuing thyroid RFA, he'd never heard of it, but he was so excited about it. When I explained it to him, he was like, this is the, this is the future of medicine. And he was the first doctor, the first local doctor that I have encountered who was open-minded to it. And mm -hmm. I just wonder if it's because of the nature of the work that you do as a pathologist that lends more to that, um, that way of thinking that, you know, this makes sense. It's just logical that you would want to treat nodules in this way. I don't know. Can you speak to that? Part, you know, part of a pathologist, you know, uh, we look at the cells. We're very, you know, um, sensitive about our cells. We like to keep them fresh. We like to keep them, you know, not destroyed. And, and we understand the tissue because 
I don't want to flex surgeons. You know, we cut through stuff, we cut through bodies, and we know the layers and everything in our head, and we know how precious the cells will tell us. We look at the patterns and the cells and how healthy the cells looks and how vital they are. So when we procure the space or we get the space, then we try to be not gentle, but we try to be very fine. It's called the fine needle aspirin. You don't have to be forcing anything in. You don't have to be very aggressive because the more aggression, the more blood you will get. The cells will flow into your needle. If you're and you're right in your technique, everything will be in your needle puck. You don't have to enforce anything. You know, you don't have to be jiggling, you know, to get the cells out. They will just go because it's negative pressure. So this is the first part about your question, you know. Uh, the second part about it, that how I thought, you know, the RFA will work for me. I think to understand how cells die, because that's what we're doing. We're thermally ablating. We're heating the cells to the point they get destroyed. And then we, depending on your body, histiocytes or your macrophages or your vacuum cleaner cells, that's what they are, to go and clean up the mess. Once they clean it up, it shrinks. And so we're depending on your defense mechanism, you know, to clear this nodule. So maybe that's maybe understand, you know, how this is going to work, like the thyroid tissue when it comes out of the body, like a surgical specimen. When we cut through it, we know how it is. It's very spongy. So if you put this ablation probe into it and heat it up, it's going to crumble now. Most of them will. And when it's crumbled down, that's when you feel like it's getting down, you know, the swelling is going down, you're feeling much easier in your swallowing and breathing. And I know that your body will have the enough histiocytes or the macrophages or the mechanism to clear and clean all this, you know, burn tissue out. That's part of your immune system, right? Yes, because that's what you have to, you know, macrophages and uh -huh. necrophages and and all these cells that we don't know that they work, but they are, they come and clean up. These macrophages have to come and chew up what's left. That's, that's your vacuum cleaner. They just react and they come. And also we have the T cells and the B cells. They, they all have to come and, and work with you. I have a hypothesis then. Several patients have commented that right after their RFA, maybe for a week or two, that they feel a little bit extra tired. And I just wonder if that's maybe the extra work that their immune system is doing immediately, you know, that cleanup crew that's coming in and doing that vacuuming up of the dead cells. What do you think about that? It could be, you know, there, yeah. it could be. And this could be also the stress of having the procedure. You, you know, your body is a whole one organ. You know, it's not just the thyroid. You're stressed. You're thinking about the procedure. You're worried about how the procedure will go. You're thinking too much. You know, so much stress hormones. Having the procedure, the day of the procedure, coming home and waiting in to see, you know, if it's going to work or not. And every day you're checking yourself. That's part the immunity is, like, as you said, you know, part of that, but also the stress of the procedure. Some people, they have post-ablation syndrome, you know, like once we, we killed a lot of cells, so your body is cleaning and they can get a little bit, not fever, but tiredness and, and malaise and feeling that, but it's not in every patient. Again, you, you have encountered a lot and you did a lot of surveys with patients. On. I've had two RFAs and in the first RFA, I did feel tired for about a week, but I didn't feel bad. I just was kind of tired and the stress probably played a big role. I think for your case with the, like the amount that got ablated can cause mm. a environment, you know, because it's, it's your body's clearing, you know, that's, that's your body has to work on this area, you know, to clean it. So you believe that maybe when there is a larger amount of tissue ablated, that that could contribute possibly to some of that fatigue? I think so, because it, again, we're, we're, we're one person, we're not just a thyroid, you know, mm -hmm. we, our body react, our brain, our feelings, our emotions, everything. Of course, when we ablate it, everything, as you said, your, your muscles get swollen, the, the tissue underneath, we put lidocaine, you know, there's a lot of things. And of course, we, we induce tissue injury. Your body don't disregard that. They go and try to help you, you know, to clean, you know, the area which got ablated and help you to feel better. It's like anything, you know, else, you know, we get a common cold, our bodies try to help us to feel better. And that's what your body's trying to help. That's a really great explanation about, you know, the fatigue and the cleanup process. I really, I think that's going to be super helpful to a lot of patients just to understand exactly what's happening in their body. And, you know, I know ultimately if you were to compare the fatigue and the pain that you would experience after surgery, it's most definitely less with the RFA procedure than it would be in surgery. It is, but also, you know, surgery, once the nodule is cut out, it's a scar and it's out. RFA, you have to be patient. It will work. It just needs a little bit more time than surgery. For RFA now, they are trying to make it as one of the options, you know, or one of the modality to treat microcarcinomas of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. Especially in patients who are very early diagnosed and they want to keep their thyroid, 
but they have to be monitored, of course. There's special criteria to do that, but it's gonna work because I know the cancer, the microcarcinoma, sometimes they are four millimeter and five millimeter, but now the ultrasounds and the radiology techniques have became you know, so advanced that we detect things which early, early, like in the, mm-hmm. like stage zero, sometimes we find them. So RFA, like if we're getting advanced on that techniques, we should have other advanced techniques to battle it. Not everything, yes, surgery is good and very good, but it can sometimes, you know, there's other things we have to put in factors, you know, like the RFA for this microcarcinoma, just imagine it, I will go with the probe and under ultrasound guided, I can heat it up and kill the cancer cells all around, all around, all around, you know, watching a month later or two months later, three months, I will see my success, you know, it's gonna shrink and it's gonna mm-hmm. burn down. And this is part of me, me maybe dealing with tissue, but also, you know, part of these cancer patients, you know, before I do anything, I have to look at the lymph nodes. I scan the lymph nodes very, very thoroughly and make sure before anything, I'm not seeing like this microcarcinoma in the lymph nodes or something, because at this point, surgery will become the only option. Plus it's a lymph node, there is other, you know, other doctors has to get involved. We have to take the best decision for this patient. When you kill the cancer cells with RFA, is it dead and gone and there's no risk of recurrence or is there still that possibility that that cancer could recur down the road? You know, there is certain selections for these patients, you know, so once I know where they can, like I have to have a well-defined boundaries, you know, for for this cancer to be ablated because I want to see, you know, if it's there or not, I have to measure it. I have to know if it's the area completely got gone or not. So it, I don't think I will take a patient with extensive Hashimoto thyroiditis and try to ablate a microcarcinoma in them because again, they have already a risk of getting cancer in the thyroid multifocal because I will not be able to ablate, like to assess my success for this ablation. You know, I will not, I will be doing this patient a disfavor, you know, for this. And I had patients, they contact me for a microcarcinoma in Hashimoto and they came and they were trying. I said, you're not the best candidate for that because mm-hmm. I'll be able to assure you or be ever like feeling that you're not going to get it back because I don't know if it's going to arise in another area and you have to be very, very in like, I want to see you every three, like it's just, it's not going to work, you know, that way. So surgery was for this patient was, was the best option for these patients, you know, the one I ablate like they I have to have a well-defined borders I have to of course I do the box so I know it's cancer you know we talk to the surgeon we talk to the ENT we talk to everyone and they all are aware you know that's the best decision we go once I see the boundaries and I can ablate it you know and ablation for this cancer nodule is not just ablating the nodule I have to go over like overlapping with the benign tissue not just the area I have to go over the borders the goiters you want to be inside for the cancer no we go around it and we try to do like a tiny rim of normal tissue to make sure everything is heated up and thermally ablated and of course the patient has to be aware that they have to be in regular follow-ups they have to be compliant you know about you know our appointments so we can you know see the progress of that nodule when you say you go around the borders of that microcarcinoma is that to absolutely make sure you've gotten every trace of it yes. from the, the ablation? Uh, yeah, the nodule is, is like, is like it's most of the microcarcinoma is less than one cm, like a green pea size or smaller, you know? So you cannot just ablate the green pea. You have to go over like with the normal tissue. And it's not like a big normal tissue. Because I know in a benign nodule, you would stay inside of that. Yes, you have to stay inside as much as you can. And you, you try to leave a little actually rim to, to avoid a complication like a nodule rupture or something and of course you have to be away from any muscle like it has to be interpreting like inside the thyroid like if this is a thyroid here mm-hmm. it's not a here not here you know because at that point there is muscle you know involved and stuff i'm glad you pointed that out about it being inside the thyroid because i think so many patients think that it's just like here's my thyroid. And then on the surface of my thyroid is this nodule when really a lot of times it's actually inside of it. Most of the nodules are inside, but again, the location of them, how far they are from the borders of your muscles and nerves and veins and stuff will dictate if RFA will work for you. For any patients who are looking to connect with you or to maybe even connect their provider with you, what is the best way for patients or, or providers to find you? It's our website and they can call the office. You know, I have a wonderful staff. They they are very aware and about RFAs and I will also do other things like ethanol ablations for cystic nodules and also for 
a cancer lymph nodes. The person who is in charge for our phase is Amy. You know, she's my assistant and she's wonderful too. But anyone who answered the phone call will, will be able to help. My partners, you know, and my staff are very encouraging and very proud of our practice. I hope many more providers will send patients your way for things like this because it certainly seems to be the direction that things need to be going for patients. Yes, it is. And we will work together for more awareness of it. Thank you so much for watching. You can help others tremendously by sharing this content. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own health advocate. Now, watch this next interview right here.